To get us started today, I'd like to introduce Diana Dalton, who is the Deputy Director of the Research and Evidence Division at DFID for some opening remarks. Diana. Hi, morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to just say a few words. I'm not going to talk for long because I know you're keen to hear from the experts. Um, but I just wanted to start with a very quick anecdote. Um, so for four years from 2009, um, I worked for DFID in Bangladesh. Um, and the country was often, um, unsurprisingly, visited by the all-party parliamentary group for Bangladesh. And at that time, it was chaired by a, a lady who was the MP for St. Albans called um, Anne Main. And they visited our programmes, along with lots of programmes of um, many others. And we, of course, presented DFID's portfolio in the best light we could, trying to demonstrate the scale and the breadth um, of our portfolio, which was pretty ex extensive at the time. Um, However, she took real issue with our governance portfolio. Um, and this was an extensive portfolio. It spanned uh, work from security and justice, sector reform, public financial management, anti-corruption, and quite a lot of work on voice and accountability. And after probably about her third visit, she was so convinced that we were not spending taxpayers' money wisely that she launched a campaign to get DFID to divert its Bangladesh governance program funding to something that she considered more worthwhile. Um, in one month, she sent over 120 parliamentary questions to DFID Bangladesh officials, and she demanded to meet ministers um, about her serious concerns. And, um, and she bombarded them with weekly letters. So this was a pretty sustained campaign. Um, and uh, her letters catalogued details of perceived waste, um, through our governance programming, particularly anything that had the word capacity building in the title. And she was looking for justification through the lack of robust evidence in our answers of why £40 million a year of investment in governance programmes was not better spent on um, cataract operations, which she had ch seen change lives at about £30 a pop. And to be honest, we had a real job um, justifying why the money wasn't better spent elsewhere. We weren't categorically able to prove that what we were doing was better than doing nothing or better than doing something different. And this is partly because it's, it's difficult to do that, particularly in governance programming, but it was also because we were not really adept enough at investing our time and our money in uh, our own learning about what was effective and what was not, and then showing how we were using that knowledge um, to make future decisions. So it's in that context that I am very pleased that the UK is therefore funding uh, the £12 million Governance Crime and Conflict Initiative with JPAL. Um, this started in September 2017, but has built on, successful, on the Successful Governance Initiative, which helped plug gaps in evidence on what works in the area of governance more broadly. So you'll be hearing far more about, about this, but the GCCI adds evaluations in the area of crime and conflict um, to those of governance. Security justice and conflict prevention and resolution focuses on themes and places where people have historically concluded it is difficult to collect robust evidence. But it is where JPAL and its partners have started to demonstrate what, in fact, is possible. This is particularly a critical area for DFID because um, we've, we have, um, are increasing our resources in tackling insecurity and improving justice over a wider range of countries. We're already thinking ahead to the next govern government spending review, which starts from 2020, and we need to focus on ensuring that investments are made in interventions that we know work because there is a robust evidence base behind it. The GCCI is an important programme to help underpin this very challenging and pretty complex work. So why are we all here today? Well, when we decided to support this programme, we committed to holding more events outside the US to more widely showcase the use of RCTs and to attract a more extensive range of researchers and policymakers to think about design and implementation of rigorous impact evaluations. A number of people are still sceptical about the usefulness of RCTs and the value for money that they represent. Given their often very focused nature, the lack of read across to other countries and other contexts can be unclear or at least under-investigated. 
I am encouraged to see that JPAL and its partners are drawing from their database to counter this view and draw out generalised lessons on behaviours which may apply in more than one context. And it's worth saying here also that RCT, RCTs are used in a well-considered proportion of DFID's wider research activity in the field of governance, conflict and crime. So it's around 20% of our portfolio. And our approach is that the research question we want to answer should determine the method and the design of the research using the most rigorous methods and the resources available, typically in terms of funding, time, political capital, and of course, acceptable risk and deliverability, um, which is particularly pertinent for crime and conflict. Many complex development problems with big unanswered questions or frustrating evidence gaps don't necessarily lend themselves to an experimental method. However, JPAL and its partners and DFID through targeted funding of this activity have demonstrated that it is worth challenging those assumptions about what's not possible and be am being ambitious about coverage, rigor, measuring outcomes, and importantly about feeding knowledge back through the decision making decision and policy makers really effectively. So I'll hand over here uh, to allow the sessions to begin, but I just wanted to finish by saying you're very warm, warmly welcomed to today, to this rather marvellous venue. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll achieve a goal of you all leaving here with new ideas and, and particularly a personal appetite for getting more involved in rigorous impact evaluations, either as a researcher, a policymaker with interventions that need to be tested, or as a user of rigorous evidence to better inform your work as it develops. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you very much, Diana, for that lovely welcome. And in addition to the welcome from DFID, I would like to welcome you all here on behalf of JPAL and IPA and uh, all of the researchers who work with our organizations um, together. We're very excited to have you here. So we're looking forward today to uh, launching into a couple of really exciting panel discussions about the policy lessons that have emerged from randomized evaluations in governance, crime, and conflict, as well as new research in these areas that's just getting started and that will push forward these frontiers. So I'll take a moment before we turn to the panels to introduce you to the GCCI, which uh, Diana has, has just kindly given a brief overview to, to randomized evaluations or randomized control trials, the methodology for understanding impact that researchers in our network use, and to JPAL and IPA, the two organizations that are together implementing this grant. So the Governance, Crime, and Conflict Initiative tests solutions that can help low and middle income countries overcome violence and corruption that they're facing, examine and try to understand what the root causes of instability and insecurity are in countries that are plagued by conflict, and to support recovery and resilience in countries that have been affected by conflict and disaster, whether that's man-made or, or natural in nature. Now, GCCI, as we've mentioned, is implemented by the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab and IPA, and we conduct several activities. So first, at the core of what we're doing, together with the researchers in our network and policymakers, like many of you who are gathered here today, is to identify research gaps within these very broad themes. What are the questions that policymakers would love to know and to understand and to have evidence on to help guide decision making? We then run a competitive process to fund research, to actually generate evidence on the impact of programs that are designed to, to essentially be solutions to try to address some of these issues and to understand what works, what doesn't, and why. We then, as JPAL and IPA, together with the academic affiliates in our network, synthesize this research and work to disseminate it to policy audiences, both here, like we're doing today, and in countries around the world. And finally, we're focused on building the capacity of researchers in um, other parts of the world and of policymakers to generate and to use evidence in their own decision making processes. Now, within the GCCI, these activities are carried out by three linked research initiatives, and I'll take a brief opportunity to introduce each of these to you today. So, first is the Governance Initiative, which, thanks to generous support from DFID, Hewlett Foundation and an anonymous donor has been uh, around since 2011 and is designed to understand the drivers of good governance. And we focus on three primary areas here. First, 
around increasing political participation and citizen participation in the political pro process. Second, reducing corruption and leakages in uh, the service delivery and, um, process. And third, strengthening the capacity of the state to deliver quality services to its citizens. The second and, and the first of our new kind of additional areas to this research under the, the GCCI is the Crime and Violence Initiative. So this was founded just last year to understand both what the drivers of crime and violence are and what the impact of mitigation efforts actually is. And this focuses on various aspects of crime, both uh, violent and property crime as well as organized crime, aspects of social violence, both between individuals and between groups, and a wide range of uh, kind of manifestations of political violence. Finally, the Peace and Recovery Program was also founded last year thanks to support from DFID and focuses on supporting recovery and resilience in countries affected by conflict and disaster. And here, the, the program is focusing on rehabilitation and recovery, on um, crisis prevention, response and recovery, on a wide range of policy issues that are facing refugees and host communities um, where refugees have fled, and state and institution building and service delivery generally in the context of fragile or conflict affected states. So these are the kind of three broad streams of work that the GCCI helps to support. And you'll hear several examples of research kind of addressing these themes on our panels today. But first, I'll describe a study funded under the predecessor to GCCI, which is the Governance Initiative, and use this both to demonstrate the kinds of questions that, that can be asked uh, with a randomized evaluation, and also use it as an opportunity to bring us all onto the same page with respect to the methodology of, of what a randomized evaluation actually is. So we'll shift here to research conducted by Jay Powell, an IPA researcher, and Drilla Dubé and her co-authors in Sierra Leone. So they're working in Sierra Leone about 10 years after the conclusion of Civil War. And they conducted a randomized evaluation of a community reconciliation program that was designed to address you know, issues that remain about a decade onwards after the conclusion of Civil War. Researchers worked together with a Sierra Leonean NGO called Fambul Talk, which had designed this uh, community reconciliation program. And Fambul Talk was quite enthusiastic about the program and eager to work with researchers to understand, does this program, in fact, you know, we've laid out a theory of change as to how this reconciliation program can help to address you know, some of these uh, negative outcomes uh, that are as a result of, of civil war. Does the program, in fact, uh, accomplish each of those objectives? And so they partnered together with researchers to test the impact of the program. The program itself entailed a couple of months of community organization in targeted communities and culminated in a traditional bonfire ceremony in which victims could share their experiences and perpetrators could publicly seek forgiveness from their community. So now shifting to what this means kind of from a research methodology perspective. So Fonville Talk, of course, like many NGOs and, and governments, is resource constrained, is unable to cover every single community in the country you know, all at once. And so they have to make some decisions about where and how they're going to roll out the program. And in fact, this creates a great opportunity to consider incorporating impact evaluation into the program. So we'll kind of get a little bit abstract here to, to demonstrate the idea. So researchers work together with Fumble Talk to identify sections within villages where they intended to roll out and to, to introduce this program. So they had 100 sections within 10 villages that were eligible to receive the program, but resources to reach only 50 of those. So we start with a sample of these 100 villages, excuse me, sections within villages. Researchers then worked with the NGO to randomly assign those sections to either the group that would receive the reconciliation program or a comparison group that would not. So at this point, they've randomly split these 100 sections into two groups. And what's notable here is that by making this assignment randomly into these two groups, the groups of sections are on average identical in all ways on observable factors, things like average income, average education, and on unobservable factors in terms of individuals' kind of you know, personal experiences in the conflict or kind of their mental status. Fumble Talk then implemented the reconciliation program in just one of these two groups. So they implemented the reconciliation uh, program with 50 of these randomly selected villages, but also tracked uh, 50 of these villages as the comparison group. 
And over a number of kind of follow-up studies, uh, excuse me, follow-up uh, surveys, measured the outcomes for both groups. So nine months after the Community Reconciliation Program and again three years later. Now these two groups continue to be identical and always with the exception of the fact that one group received the reconciliation program. And what this means is that any differences in outcomes that we observe uh, can actually be attributed as having been caused by the community reconciliation program. So in this case, what did researchers learn? First, they found that the program did lead to increased forgiveness of perpetrators and strengthened community ties. They also found that it worsened psychological health and well-being, and this showed up in terms of increased prevalence of post-traumatic stress disorder and increased rates of depression and anxiety among sections that had participated in the reconciliation program. And these both positive and negative effects persisted over three years. So at the conclusion of the study, researchers and Fumble talked together kind of concluded that this program and this approach to reconciliation holds a great deal of promise, but because it dredges up these kind of issues that individuals and communities had developed coping mechanisms around, that a greater emphasis on supporting the mental health kind of aspects uh, of these reconciliation programs might be a promising future direction for policy and for programming in these areas. So that's just an example. You're, you'll hear several more um, today from researchers who've worked on, on randomized evaluations of their own. So now, as I'm closing, just want to share uh, a bit about JPAL and IPA, the two organizations that are implementing this grant. We both work together to reduce poverty by ensuring that policy is informed by scientific evidence. We together have a network of offices in 24 countries around the world. And the research that is conducted um, by, by the researchers in our network is done by over 200 um, leading academics who are based at 50 universities around the world. So you'll hear from a subset of them today, and we're very excited about that. And together, this network has generated over a thousand randomized evaluations in more than 80 countries. So odds are, where you're working, there's some evidence either on the content or in the context where you're working that we'd be very enthusiastic to share with you. We'd of course like to thank DFID very much for their support of GCCI and much of the research that you'll hear described today has been supported by DFID. We'd also like to thank, um, from the JPAL perspective, Community Jamil, the social enterprise organization that has supported and partnered with JPAL since 2005. JPAL is named after the late Abdul Latif Jamil, whose philanthropic work is continued today by Community Jamil. And we're very pleased to be joined today by Fadi Jamil, the president of Community Jamil International. Fadi, thank you very much for coming. Now finally, before I turn it over to Rohini for your keynote today, I want to just note a couple of things that we'd like to pick up with you over the lunch this afternoon, opportunities to collaborate with GCCI. Um, we have several GCCI staff who are here and who will make themselves known. Um, we'd love to speak with you about opportunities to evaluate promising programs that you are implementing or that you're funding to generate new lessons to understand how we might be able to apply lessons from existing uh, research to policy questions that you're facing and to feed some of these learnings into policy decisions. And we'd also love to talk about building capacity in the various you know, training and capacity building um, opportunities and, and tools that we have available for both understanding the research um, or for having greater access to the methodology. So look forward to continuing those conversations over the tea breaks and over lunch. And for now, I'll turn it over to Rohini Pandey, who is an economics professor at the Harvard Kennedy School and is a co-chair of the Governance, Crime, and Conflict Initiative. Thank you very much. So um, let me start on behalf of the researchers of both thanking all of you for coming here and also importantly for the different groups that have funded some of the research I'm going to be talking about. I'm an economist who works between political economy and development. I'm based at um, the Harvard Kennedy School. And I've been involved together with Professor Ben Olkun at MIT in co-leading the uh, JPAL political economy and government group. What I wanted to do today was try to provide some, I think, current motivation for why I think the issues that GCCI is looking at are perhaps more relevant than they, ha they were when we started in 2011. And also uh, to give you some sense of a few of the projects that have actually taken place under GCCI, under GI. So I titled the talk Enabling the Great Escape, really building on um, a very well-known paper, a very well-known book by Professor Angus Deaton, who talked about the great miracle that took place after uh, World War II in terms of declines in poverty. So just to remind you, this graph shows um, the proportion of the population 
living below a dollar ninety a day, so who we think of the extreme poor. And I think one of the in incredible successes of international development has been the, sh the extreme decline in this number from roughly over less than uh, one in two, something like 40% of the world's population living under a dollar ninety a day in 1980, to really today being just one in 10 uh, living under a dollar ninety a day. And of course, a lot of this uh, decline was driven by China, which you can see uh, in the green line. And I think it le leads many to believe that, you know, maybe growth is what economists should focus on. But I think what we see today is a different kind of great escape, which has made, uh, I think, many people very concerned about the possibility of just relying on growth, which is what we are seeing with migration. So this is um, a, a data from the Eurostat data that tells us that starting from 2010 till today, at least one million sub-Saharan Africans have moved to Europe. And I think the consequences of how this is playing out, I think many of us have seen. And this is realized um, immigration. Um, the Pew Research Center also did a set of surveys to ask how many uh, in African countries, what fraction would like to migrate. And there we see uh, relatively high numbers, even in countries that we would think of as relative success stories. So if you look at um, um, this survey, it suggests that roughly half or more of the citizens of sub-Saharan Africa see that they would have better economic opportunities or better lives if they move elsewhere. Now, there's one view that we should just open our borders and allow uh, individuals to come in. But the flip side, of course, is that if we look at just uh, survey data, say, in Europe, what we see is not a lot of keenness to have open borders. So this is the European Social Survey of 2014, and it shows you um, attitudes towards different sorts of migrants. And if you look at this group, which is really poor countries outside Europe, I think there is a very few fraction of people who say allow many. I, I don't think people say no one should be allowed, but I think there's certainly a view that there must be some set of constraints on who is allowed to come. And I, th and I think when today observers look at what's happening uh, in a number of uh, countries, it, in advanced industrial economies, they worry that this difference between where um, citizens of de the develop wo developing world, especially in Africa, want to go, and host communities is leading to a lot of social strain. And I think this was well brought out by perhaps one of the most prescient observers of change, George Soros, in a very recent um, speech just a few days ago, where he talked about how um, at first, most people sympathized with the plight of refugees, but they didn't want their everyday lives dis disrupted by a breakdown in social services. And soon they became disillusioned with the failure of the authorities to cope. Um, so at first, he, I think what's interesting is he very much puts the relationship of citizens with the state up front. And then in the proposal he put forward as well, he put forward this proposal that he felt that there should be a Marshall Plan for Africa. Interestingly, a Marshall Plan that he argued that should go towards building and fortifying democratic nations in Africa. And I think this kind of a proposal, to me, brings out very much the reason for why uh, researchers working in the areas of political economy and government hope to contribute. Because you can look at the European Marshall Plan and think of it as a great success. But I think the closest near example of the Marshall Plan that my colleague uh, Mike Callan uh, gave me the numbers for is really what the U.S. did in Afghanistan. So since 9-11, the U.S. has spent $113 billion on civil reconstruction in Afghanistan, which is more than the Marshall Plan in real terms. And we know that there's been a limited amount to show for that. I think more broadly, if we just think about the successes of aid, one factor that's often pointed out is that if we just look, so this blue line shows you the graph I showed you earlier, which is really the decline in poverty just translated into the amount of dollar nineties a day multiplied by number of people poor. So you can think of that as a crude, one crude way of thinking about just the poverty shortfall in monetized terms. And this red line shows you the, re the rise in total net ODA. And this graph that was first put out by Brookings shows that after around 2006, we have enough resources. So I think if we look at a lot of the sort of social and political issues facing both, I think, rich and poor countries, and we think about the development uh, issues on the table today about how do we end extreme poverty, how do we reach SDG goals, 
I think I'd argue that a lot of this reflects not about how we should raise resources, but it's really about the politics of how we allocate resources. And that really is the central theme of the work that um, you know, we hope to support under different aspects of GCCI, is really trying to understand in a world that has a lot of money, how do we actually reach the development goals that we want to? So I just wanted to spend one minute talking about some issues with thinking about trying to achieve this outside the democratic state and argue why in the, in, in the work that we've been um, supporting, we've tried to very centrally put the state in place. So if you look in 2013, one big concern with spending in a lot of these um, countries is the concern of corruption. And this idea that if you, if you give aid dollars to weak states that may not reach the poor, often leads to moving outside the state. So if you look at AIDS data, uh, in 2013, only 7% of humanitarian ODA was implemented through recipient states. Now you could say that makes sense because these are states that really don't have capacity at the time when they're hit by a crisis like a big earthquake or a hurricane. But equally when we look at social aid, uh, which is much more sectoral program, uh, programmatic spending in education and health, less than half of it tends to go through recipient states as well. And this, I think, is a, was in The Economist, I think, last year, describing um, the case of Liberia, which is a country that has seen a lot of aid, of describing how what ends up happening is that you create these better-funded parallel systems that you know, may succeed in a particular job, but are certainly less accountable than the state structures that they replace. And that if we take the flip side and we look at citizens in these countries and ask whether they despair of corruption as much as many of us outside sometimes think, you need to avoid these states um, as a reason for, the, for corruption, you don't see that level of cynicism among the citizens. So this is World Value Survey data, uh, where on the x-axis is the proportion who believe politics is important. You can draw similar graphs from Gallup data on whether you believe the state should be responsible for uh, social services. And this is against just the country GDP. The, the, Black ones are fragile states. Um, the green are low-income countries. The red are middle-income countries that have at least 1% of the world's poor. And what you really see is there's not much of a pattern. It's not as if those in poor, fragile states are saying that they don't think politics is important or they want to, the state to not exist. I think they, they have a lot of desire for the state to be made functional. And so just to summarize, I think a lo large body of research, some of it experimental, a lot of it not, has really makes the point that the democratic state is the group that is ultimately going to be, have the legitimacy to both raise and allocate resources, to regulate and to maintain a monopoly of violence and security. And a lot of our work in GCCI is really asking how do we ensure that the state is able to carry out these tasks. We also recognize that the democratic state has to be considered flexibly. You know, sometimes it can, we can think of it as the nation state, but very often it's local governments. So if you think about um, experiences say, in fragile states like Afghanistan, often the way that you can build democratic states is bottom up. A lot of the work that we've seen come out on CDDs, for instance, has been about working at local levels of democracy. And then finally, size. So in high poverty middle income countries, we see very clearly in the data that the domestic state revenues completely dominate aid flows. And so aid can often do much better by identifying how to strategically improve this domestic state rather than putting its own programs in place. And a lot of our aim in providing evidence is to identify ways in which you can make these kind of strategic um, interventions. And so I want to spend the last five minutes of my talk really giving you a few examples from work that was funded under the initial uh, governance initiative to show on how we have started to build a body of evidence on how to strengthen the democratic state. So um, one thing that a lot of our, uh, our uh, kind of work that gets put out is based on is a white paper where we identify the key themes of, of research. And, one way we focus this on is to identify at the, at the base of it one specific way of um, thinking about reforming the state, which is an economic perspective of thinking of what we would call a principal agent model. And this is a model that very centrally is a people-centered view of the state that says the state isn't a black box of one person who wants to rent, seek, or 
a group of anonymous people, but it's a set of people engaged in a chain of activities. And what you want to think about is how do you make each of those um, agents involved in these activities have interests that are aligned with those of citizens. So this is a very simple depiction of this kind of what I call the human chain, is that you have a citizen out here, and this is what we think about as the representative democracy, who's delegating activities to a politician. The politician is often further delegating it to a bureaucrat. The bureaucrat, in turn, often ends up having an elected local representative at a village level who she delegates it to. And then, interestingly, that local representative is often trying to go back to the citizen but now make the citizen do something. So for instance, they may want the citizen to take up deworming pills for their kid or bed nets. And so one thing you see here is that the citizen is both what we would call the ultimate principle, who is, whose preferences should be reflected, but it's also often the person who you're trying to get to do things, um, who you, you may want to try to, as a state, be paternalistic towards and identify activities. And recognizing, the, seeing the circle has helped us conceptualize of research often as trying to fix specific links. But we also recognize for the politics of reform to succeed, you can't just fix one link. You often have to make sure that incentives are aligned along this entire circle. So very briefly, let me just talk about a few examples. So first example, which really comes to this idea of here, is that can you, by engagement, correct engagement of the citizen as an agent, actually improve how they uh, hold the state accountable. So um, um, Jonathan Weigel, who is an, uh, now starting as an assistant professor at LSE, worked in the Democratic Republic of Congo and um, asked a question of, can taxation increase participation? So he worked in the, in the, with the governor of Kananga to put in place a door-to-door -door property tax campaign in DRC and then showed first that your beliefs about the state legitimacy affected your willingness to uh, take part in those activities, but importantly, also your existing beliefs of the uh, your existing beliefs were changed when you saw a state that functioned. You were more likely. This is a photograph of town hall meetings that were held, where citizens came in and um, said what they wanted to be done with the resources. So both the campaign in um, increased uh, tax resource collection. Importantly, it improved citizens' perceptions of state legitimacy because they were able to participate in the state. So that's a case of where uh, you may be thinking of the citizen as an agent from whom you want to get tax resources, but by put, embedding it in a, in a democratic system that allows you opportunity to politically participate, you also strengthen the state. Here's another example from Sierra Leone. Uh, where um, the researchers worked to have televised uh, parliamentary candidate debates before the election. They found that this both increased voter knowledge of candidate qualifications, but also made it more likely that the voters were going to be able to elect a candidate who, whose preferences were aligned with what they wanted. Importantly, they saw this actually translated actually at the stage of policy outcomes. So politicians increased campaign spending in areas with debate screenings and after election, spent more on development assistance. Um, this is, interestingly, we find similar effects when you actually inform politicians as well that they will be reported on. So in um, Delhi, I and co-authors worked where we informed politicians to, or incumbent um, councillors two, two years before the election that they will be reported on in newspapers at the time of election. So they knew that two years ahead, what they do will actually reach the voters. And we found that this affected their willingness to spend on areas uh, preferred by slum dwellers, which largely meant spending less on roads and more on sanitation. And importantly, we actually found the political system respond. So parties were also more likely to give tickets to high-performing incumbents. So that's on the side of, if we go back here, that's really on the side of looking at this part, asking how do we improve either citizens' ability to hold politicians accountable, or by engaging citizens more in the political process, improve them as agents. There's been a whole host of work really looking at just implementation of what we might think of as the building state capacity literature. Um, and one part of that that I just wanted to highlight is transparency seems to be an extremely important aspect even of governance um, implementation. So we have a number of projects that if audits reveal truthful information, that seems to have significant effect in improving implementation. 
since I'm short of time, I won't go them in a lot of detail, but I think uh, um, JPL and IPA have made policy briefs available on much of this work. So let me just conclude with, uh, I think, a couple of takeaways from the body of research that we've begun collecting. As I've argued, the, the kind of politics of public policy today is really central to our ability to address development challenges. And so to deny politics or try to believe that one can function in this world where it's just about getting the dollars to a poor citizen without thinking about the politics and the power structures they function within is probably something that is not going to be very successful. Um, at the same time, I think there isn't reason to be so cynical to assume that you have to avoid the state in the developing world. Um, I think one of, the, to me, the most optimistic messages coming out of the work we funded is that um, a combined judicious use of theory and empirical evidence can inform us both in a context, but also provide us proof of concept about ideas that we can take further. And so this may seem sort of somewhat trite as thinking about high return users of aid, but it is striking how often uh, there, there is, there, politics doesn't enter the discussions of how to spend aid. And so I think it's important to point out that even in fragile states where there is clearly a lot of emergency of urgency of getting aid to um, the vulnerable citizens, it's important to think about how you'll build and reinforce democratic states. And I think in high poverty middle income countries like Nigeria, Indonesia, India, China, uh, aid is a very small part now. But it's still so something that can play a strategic role in helping to empower poor citizens by enabling, for instance, structures of transparency around how spending occurs. I think you're going to hear from two panels today who are going to kind of give you just very rich examples of different ways in which they've engaged with policymakers and governments in these settings. So let me stop here. Thank you very much again for coming, and we hope we have rest of the day.